Um, so there's this alleged, uh, th there's this thing that I was reading recently where there's this like alleged psychological principle where let's say like if you don't really, let's say you don't really have a home to go to, you don't have a place to go back to. Uh, if you are say for example in a public space uh, mm -hmm. or in like a public bathroom, uh, you feel psychologically uh, a sort of a sort of natural psychological impulse to be more inclined to have control over that space, uh, which some people kind of theorize has this like, uh, you know, it, it, it's, they, people theorize about it having kind of a deep uh, psychological importance. Uh, now, with regard to that, um, I wish I could uh, recommend a like piece of writing that I could cite. Uh, yeah, yeah. About sort of these deep psychological notions. Uh, but it was just a Twitter thread, so I do sound like fucking Nancy Grace <laughs> right now. Uh, hi, welcome to Film Critters Process. Welcome to Film Critters Processes. Uh, act like you fucking own the place. We're here to talk about Parasite. Um, Parasite. Mm -hmm. On this fine eve, we're gonna. The, they can't see that it's bright out. So yeah, they we're can't. pretending that it's Parasite Eve, so I can make this pun. Yeah, it's bright out, so it is exactly uh, 12 p.m. in Seattle. Uh, no, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no further. We've got, no. we've got a we've got a single window of time in which we can get our vitamin D in. <laughs> About 30 minutes, uh, yeah. and then after that, it's uh, it's all off. Um, hi, I am Baru. I am Jay Bearhat. Um, and yeah, obviously we watched uh, Parasite. Um, one of one of the two movies that we've been super excited about. Yeah. So excited that uh, Bruce saw this one two and a half. Kind of two and a half ish times. Yeah. Yeah. I yes. Um, Bong Joon Ho is my uh, favorite director. Um, you know, take that as you will. Uh, and uh, yeah, I am vibrating with excitement. So you're, about you're, this a movie. you're a little biased. You're a little biased. You know, this. I might have a little bit of a bias. I might oh, just be. Uh, this might be looking the other way. I on might Bong Joon Ho's flaw. <laughs> <laughs> I might have walked into the door on this Palm Door winning several. Already giving it five stars on Letterboxd. So, yeah, no, I walked. I walked into the theater and gave it that five star rating. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm really excited about Parasite. Jay is really excited about the Lighthouse, right. which we're going to talk about in a separate episode. That's that's the one that I went and saw too. Maybe another half an hour, and maybe another half time. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, so we're both really we're, we're, we're amped up. We're amped up. It's it's a really good season for movies. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover, and I really don't want this to just be an episode of me kind of blabbering for five hours. I am fine listening to you blabber and occasionally throwing in, because I really liked Parasite, but I did not see it two times. Right. Uh, and I, the the little bit I caught on the first watch through, I was like, oh, this is definitely a movie where the next time I watch it, I'm going to like catch parallels that I missed like from the first and second half. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I know there was at least one I caught, which was the... The hot sauce being sprayed on the pizza and then yeah. the equating that to blood. And then in the second half of the film, there's uh, the the blood splattering onto like a cake or something. Ooh. Where like they were filmed very visually the same. Ugh. And, and I caught it because when they did the hot sauce on the pizza, I was like, that's going to come up again later. Like that. Yes. And then the exact shot is played again, but with blood on, uh, blood on a cake. Yes. And we're going to cite a lot of things like that. And I... Uh kind of want to come out the gate and say that we're not necessarily trying to do kind of a cinema sins like that you didn't notice this it's it's really more just like 15 things you didn't catch in parasite <laughs> did you notice that there was two families <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly like there there's a lot of depth and a lot of uh context to this movie that i kind of just want to highlight uh and and kind of celebrate in this video and that's kind of what that's kind of like what we're hoping to do and also like i have some flaws with the movie and we'll, we'll just kind of chat we'll chat it up but before we go before i go into that jay what were your general reactions to parasite because i'm interested to hear um okay uh, because you've seen it twice and i assume probably have notes i'm gonna probably rely yes. on you to give me character names oh yeah absolutely. because like in my mind it's like fail son uh <laughs> hacker daughter yeah dad mom tech dad uh wine mom <laughs> yeah um <laughs> art son <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and the, the, the girl. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and we can kind of switch between referring to them as like poor son, rich son, poor, poor son, rich, poor son, daughter, yeah. rich daughter, that kind of thing. But I, it wasn't until as I was listening us off that I realized both the rich son and the poor son are fail sons. <laughs> <laughs> In much different ways. In very we'll, different ways. Which yeah. we'll happily unpack here. Um, but yeah, did you, what, what did you think? My, my initial thought was like, okay, so this is the thing I've been telling people about people about the film to kind of sell them on it is that I really, is that it is a film about like class war, obviously that's mm -hmm. what everyone's talking about. Everyone's, everyone's gabbing about the class war in this movie. Um, <laughs> It is. It quite literally does what Joker wishes 
No, yeah. Or what? Sorry, it does what people think the people keep saying the Joker did, but didn't actually do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and probably one of my favorite elements of that is the fact that um, the poor people in Parasite suck. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, well, they suck. They suck. Like, not in a like they're the bad guys way, but in the sense that like you know they're they're not per- nobody in the film is portrayed as like innocent naive there there's no the, the the victim victimizer dynamic of the film isn't this like scrooge tiny tim dynamic yeah it's a like poor people realizing just how oblivious rich people are to what they have to deal with absolutely and how like sm- like slightly judgmental and exploitative they are and just how completely like it doesn't even register them to the idea that they're exploiting people absolutely yeah and that's that's really what the film is about so it's important to me that the poor characters aren't like noble good people they're scammers they're scam artists absolutely um they're kind of assholes to each other they make shitty decisions but like the whole point of the film to me is that like you you are on their side yeah like you are aware that they're be desperate people making desperate choices and you are aware that they're to, to the rich people it literally does not matter who drives yeah. their car <laughs> <laughs> that's that's another thing uh, the one thing i will say is that like a lot of the laugh out loud lines in parasite things like Oh, she could be a really great con artist if she wanted to. Yeah. Like, or like, yeah, I'm going to get these graduation documents. I just printed them out a little bit early. Everyone is temporarily poor. Uh, yeah. Nobody, nobody like, and that's the thing that this movie largely grapples with is the notion of poverty being considered as something that is like a temporary embarrassing stage in someone's life, where as it is a lot more complicated than that. And there are a lot of things that decide, there are a lot of outside deciding factors on who uh, gets success that that really is like a really big theme i love in it is that it's very clear from the get-go that the family has been impoverished their entire lives or struggling to some degree their entire lives maybe they're struggling worse than they have before maybe they're doing slightly better than they have before Mm -hmm. but it's very much so just like the struggling that they're dealing with is just so normalized to them that they don't notice it yeah and also they still you know they still believe like oh if i make these series of correct decisions then i'll be fine absolutely and like i will climb up like the the the, the fail son's whole like ongoing essentially delusion of living in the rich person's house someday right and us as the audience like it kind of progressively being like that's never going to happen like that yeah. just is not going to happen absolutely one of the most heartbreaking like last shots in the film which yeah another thing i want to come back God. to so, oh. uh, yeah there's a specific when that shot scene was playing out and he was writing the letter i was like wait, how is he supposed to get, like, this rich of everything that's gone on? And then, yeah. like, and then it cuts back to, and it's just him fantasizing about it while he's writing the letter. And then he, like, looks at the camera, and it's just this sort of, like, slight moment of him, like, realizing, like, both, how am I going to get this letter to my father? Mm-hmm. And also, like, how am I going to actually do that? Like, yeah. there's no, act. like, that is that is literally a fantasy that I'm never going to achieve. Yeah, talking for a moment about Bong Joon-ho's kind of humanistic directorial touch, um, I this movie to me was the most similar. And I, if people really liked Parasite, I would I would most recommend Barking Dogs Never Bite, which is his first feature. Um, it actually it has like the same bit of like fumigation where like a guy is a guy is walking his like girlfriend's dog. Like his girlfriend is basically the breadwinner. Yeah, uh, and she gets a dog, and he's like broke as fuck. He's like, "How are we gonna care for this dog?" She's like, "I am gonna care for this dog, and you're a deadbeat, and you're gonna walk it for me." Uh, <laughs> so he goes out and walks, and it like walks it right next to the fumigation, and then like there's just a lot of there's like a lot of um, comparisons. Uh, one of the major comparisons that Bong Joon Ho makes uh, throughout his career is between um, poor people and ghosts, uh, or or like poverty and like sort of these ab- the abject, um, yeah. which makes me truly love him. There's a lot of, uh, there's basically an extended sequence in Barking Dogs where there's a ghost story that's told. Uh, and it's, it's kind of like this weird abstract ghost story, but it kind of culminates in the presumption that the thing, the force that they're talking about, or like the noises is actually like just a homeless person that's squatting like underneath the school. And it's 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 kind of like treated tonally as scary, but then the camera lingers on the homeless person, and they're just like, and and then like you get more sort of definition of this homeless person character as like he's just kind of chilling, like he's just he's just kind of a dude. Yeah. Um, and that is sometimes where I think uh, Bong Joon Ho can like kind of struggle with that humanistic touch, where like the last shot of Parasite being uh, 
the audience looking at the sun directly in the eyes and being like, kid, you're never going to fucking make it. Like, that's really rough. But then to to kind of pay him a little bit more of a compliment, immediately prior to that shot is uh, another shot that I'll I'll kind of just explain to get it out of the way because it it, it hit me so hard the second time I was watching it that I had like a really emotional reaction um, where there's a tracking shot of uh, the camera moving from you know, frame right to frame left as uh, the son, uh, Kiwu, uh, leaves the house with the college papers to meet the rich family. Um, so it's kind of just like, it, it's like immediately after uh, Kim Ki-tek, the dad, talking about like, oh, you have a plan, you have a plan. All right, I'm so proud of you, you have a plan. Your plan's going to get us, you know, you're going to get success. Uh, yeah. And then the culmination of that plan is the exact same tracking shot happening from from frame right to frame left of uh, Kim Ki Tech in the in the like dream sequence where where Kiwo is imagining buying this house, um, Ki Tech comes up from the basement and moves across the frame in exactly the same way that Kiwo did to oh. meet Kiwo outside. Uh, so it's it's it really shows like the like the sort of the sort of capitalist. Uh, sort of contrivance of like you have to have a plan come up with a plan for yourself uh and and like all of this stuff throughout the movie of uh Kitek, like struggling with the concept of what a plan even entails and what and what happens to a person emotionally when a plan can go wrong and then the ending being like here's the culmination of kiwu's plan yeah and that's really effective <laughs> it's, it's it's just it's just masterful now masterful storytelling don't know what to tell you guys. He's a good director. <laughs> Listen, fuckers. Listen, assholes. I don't know what fucking shit you were watching over there <laughs> beating off to Miss Marvel 7. <laughs> <laughs> Another... How does it compare to the scene in uh, in Joker where he goes down the stairs? <laughs> it, yeah, no. I, I, I think the Joker the Joker stair scene is much better than that. It's, it's so much, like, you know, it just says more. Well, because it does, it does a looping thing as well where at the start of the scene he has a cigarette and then he throws it and then yeah. at the end of the scene he has the cigarette again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like mirroring. It's, it's like cinematic mirror. it's, like, it's, it's like, like poetry. Parallels. It rhymes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna I, we're gonna try to not do it, but we are gonna shit on Joker a lot. <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, that's the thing is that this movie is getting a lot of comparisons to Joker because it thematically tackles the same thing, and also weird weird coincidence has like a weird like laughing tick in both movies. Oh yeah, yeah. Because yeah. at, at the end of at the end of Parasite, he will goes un, undergoes uh, brain surgery, and there's this there's all of a sudden this temporary symptom of just him laughing at everything. Um, that scene also when he wakes up from the brain surgery, he specifically notes like. I saw a uh, I saw a detective that didn't look like a detective and a lawyer that didn't look like a lawyer. That's such a good line. Or, or like and a and a doctor that didn't look anything like a doctor, which is a beautiful line. Um, and uh, but like they they have kind of the same thematic content of uh, class war. Um, and uh, I, I would actually rec- one of the videos about this I would recommend is by a, a channel called The Week I Review. I, I checked out a little bit of it. Uh, it's a, it's a video called Parasite is the movie Joker wishes it could be. I can't believe somebody said the exact thing that I said at yeah. the start of this. Cause like, I didn't even know about this video. I no, just yeah. like, I just walked out of it being like, wow, that movie's literally like everything people were saying Joker was that I was like, I don't really see it. I actually see in this movie. I, I just think that like Parasite has a way more adept, um, sort of assessment of class struggle, uh, and just a way more focused view, um, in a, in a way that we're in, in a way that like we can definitely go into here. Ha, ha, yeah, ha. And we're going to. Ha, bleh. <laughs> bleh. I did really like um, the the one minorish complaint I would have about that ending. Yeah, and this is going to sound very cinema sensey. The kind of contrivance of him having to be just looking inside the house to see the message from his father. I can I can accept it because everything else in the movie is really good. But that one I was a little like, okay, I get that the dad is probably sending this message out like every night, and this just happens to be a night that he catches it. Yeah. But it is also very like, but why is he going up onto this hill to look in on a, uh, the house that someone else is living in now? Yeah. And I mean, the house is also just such a source of such a complicated source of pain for that character too, right? Yeah. Like it's. You know this this kind of weird returning to the scene of the crime notion, which I I find ultimately it's 
believable. It's just a little bit. It's it's a little bit like it's probably the weakest. Yeah, it, it's just it's it's to me it's just it's sort of the weakest weakest little scene in the film, and it's just because it, it it momentarily made me step out because I thought that there was like. I thought the scene was going that, like, he had set up something of his father, and so he knew his dad was in the basement before, and that that was how they were communicating. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then it's real, like, no, he doesn't know his dad's in the basement. He's just looking at this house, and I was like... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I did like the bit in the scene right before that where he talks about how he was being trailed for weeks, and the first thing we see <laughs> is one of the cops that doesn't look like a cop uh, literally tripping and falling down the stairs, <laughs> following him and him turning around and, like, doing the, like... I definitely saw you, and we both know I saw you, but we're both going to pretend we I didn't. Yeah. Be, so, because this is embarrassing for both of us. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate the, like, laser focus vision of, uh, especially, like, that and all of the scenes of sort of bureaucratic process in comparison with the rich people's idea of the world, which is very, like, TV-influenced. Uh, like, the scene where the scene where he is, the scene where he talks to his wife, and he's like, damn, I can't believe my driver fucked in my car, which I don't drive, by the way. Oh, uh, that was so I, they're probably uh, his, on meth his, or cocaine. We, his weird fantasy where he's like, I bet he fucked in my seat. What kind of man would do that? Does he does he get off on having sex in my seat? But the way he's like, dude, are you getting off on this? And then yeah. later, oh yeah, he is. He is. <laughs> he literally is. <laughs> Funniest line in the fucking movie, by the way, is when they're like having sex on the couch and she's just like, oh, buy me drugs, buy yeah. me drugs. <laughs> it's like... <sighs> Literally, I I saw that with a bunch of my 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 dirtbag furry friends. Yeah, and we t- and I literally leaned over to one of them during that would scene, and I was like, "Ah, the rich ain't too different from us." Is no. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out we're not so different yeah, after all. We all fetishize disgusting, awful things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, it's just, it's like that scene is so perfect, especially just like. I love how there's so many moments in the film that have great, like, dramatic and, politi- and like, commentary level things. But, like, that scene where it's, like, it contributes so much to the narrative and the vibe of the film. Yeah. And is also, like, gut-busting funny. It's so funny. It, it is the kind of joke you would see in a fucking, like, uh, fucking Todd Phillips, like, The Hangover-style comedy. Mm-hmm. But is delivered and executed and framed by the film around it so much better that it actually becomes funny. Yeah, and I, I'd like to give a little bit of a spotlight to each each individual, or not each character, but, like, characters that kind of stand out to me. Uh, Mr. Park, who's the rich family's father figure, um, he is a tech mogul. He is uh, he runs a company called Another Brick. Well, I'm so glad you noticed that because yeah. I didn't, because, like, I knew that he was some, I, I gathered that he was some sort of tech mogul from the way they were framing things. Yeah. But the fact that his company is named Another Brick yeah. is so funny. That's yeah, exactly. so, it's perfect. And also, like, he makes like, he makes, like, augmented reality stuff, I think is what the, the news article says. Yeah, well, there's this, there's the sequence where um, Kiteko shows up at the office and he's in the office looking at VR headsets. Uh, and which is, to me, I think is a really important texture of the movie, oh, especially yeah. in comparison with another really important texture. And this is a regional thing. There's a lot of things that are like hyper regional that I had to like read about. Um, so there was this big boom of Taiwanese cake shops that opened up in Korea uh, during, I don't, I'm not really certain what the specific like era was, but it, it was essentially just this like market that appeared, created a bunch of jobs, and then all of them went out of business. And all of a sudden, all of these jobs are just gone. Oh, because um, they mentioned that in the film, like the the like that they worked at a cake shop or something, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and so like a, a bunch of people, like specifically the guy who lives in the basement, like he he's an owner of a cake shop who's like hiding from loan sharks. That was it, yeah, in yeah, the yeah. house. Um, and on a quick note, when they mention like that, and like the um, the mom puts together that they use loan sharks, the. The way she delivers the line, like, you used loan sharks is so good. Yeah. Because in that scene, she's putting on... It's very clear she's putting on this character where she's basically doing an imitation of the old housekeeper. Yeah. So she's trying to perform this role. Like, literally doing a performance of what she thinks she has to do in this situation. And that's, like, the one moment where she breaks because you can see in her face that, like... Oh, she's familiar with loan sharks. Yeah, right. Like she's yeah. either had to deal with them or she's had people in her life who've been like beaten by them. And so she's just immediately is like, there's like a moment where the facade that she's putting on breaks and she's like, oh, you're in a, you are in a bad situation. Yeah. And then she like doubles back down on that facade. Yeah. Which definitely. I like because to me that, 
the the thing I got out of that whole sequence, like from the start to that scene, is that that is the in a tragedy sense the tragic flaw of it mm -hmm. is that their aspirations and desires to be rich people leads them to essentially behave as if they are rich people. Yeah. Definitely. And that that is ultimately what ends up sacri that is ultimately what ends up being their undoing is not like you know like ah you shouldn't have done this game in the first place it's it's the fact that they adopt the values of the rich yeah or like y you kind of just want to mimic like what someone who is experiencing a comfortable charmed life is doing yeah uh, but a like the movie kind of shows a lot of the uh, sort of sacrifices of that. Uh, similarly, there's a, there's a lot of lines in this movie. Um, we'll we'll kind of loop back to Mr. Park, but there's there's like a lot of lines in this movie where like Bong Joon Ho kind of playfully talks about the value of money. Where uh, Kim, where Ki Tech is like in the basement talking to uh, the squatter, and he's like, "How disgusting! You lived here for years, and you would." just uh he's talking to the squatter and the housekeeper yeah. who are like in a relationship and he's like you lived here for years and you would just steal food from this family in the fridge how dare you and the housekeeper the former housekeeper is just like how dare you assume that we would just go up there and steal this family's food i bought it with my salary which the family is giving you yeah <laughs> yeah i forgot oh that's such a i love that line because it's such a like especially because then like the father at the end of the film is just stealing food <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah absolutely it's doubly funny in that way like but it's like i i love that because it's just it's it's such a like bro they're not gonna notice if no, you steal you, the food they don't care they're they didn't even notice when you stole the that amount of alcohol yeah like, like they don't notice that you that there's a man living under their house yeah <laughs> they're not gonna notice if you steal some of their food yeah absolutely um and jumping back to mr park uh speaking of the family like not noticing things. Uh, there's a lot of scenes where uh, I, I just love the way the rich family has this sort of world weary like way that they act. Like everyone is trying to act like each other. The rich family really wants to act like the poor family in a lot of senses because they want to be world weary and they want to understand. Uh, he keeps bringing up, I hate it when people cross the line. I, I people who cross the line, that's the that's the worst thing in the world. Uh, he comes up to the line, but he doesn't cross it. That's yeah, what's exactly. important. Uh, in spite of the fact that there are a zillion red flags from this driver who, like, is, is, like, not really focusing on his job and, like, almost getting an accident, but he doesn't recognize the red flags because you see there's this, like, great look on his face when Kitek almost gets into an accident where, uh, Mr. Park kind of looks at him and is just like, I, this has never happened before. I don't know if this is a red flag or not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, which is just, like, kind of, kind of the way that they're shown as being, like, really sheltered and really... Uh, separate from from the process of life. His whole obsession with crossing the line is also doubly funny, given the fact that, like, you fucked your wife almost in front of your kid. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, like, you fetishized the fact that your kid was outside and could see, could maybe almost see that you were, like, having sex. Like, y you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, God. I didn't even think about... Oh, it's yeah. a good movie. <laughs> yeah, there's... It's layered, man. On that note, like on the article, because you sent me a, a, a screenshot that that had been taken of the article, which reveals that he has augmented reality. A detail about it that I really like is that the article specifically mentions being able to tour Central Park without going to it. Yeah. Which is the most poverty tourist ass thing I've ever heard. <laughs> For fucking real. You can experience po uh, Central Park without having to like, you know, risk experiencing it. <laughs> <laughs> It, it's like it feeds so well into like that's the world this guy comes from absolutely and there are so many touches in the movie that are about like experiencing life but not experiencing life uh i did notice having watched through it a couple times uh da song the rich son yeah uh does not say a single word to his biological mother for the entirety of the film there's this weird dynamic where like da song and his mother have absolutely no relationship to speak of but he's extremely close with the housekeeper, who is the one who is seen. Like, when, when Da Song is introduced, he shoots the arrow and the housekeeper goes and gives him attention. And, yeah. like, and like you know, plays with him while the mother sits down and talks and doesn't do any of the actual work of motherhood. Uh, which results in Da Song having, like, a fucked up weird relationship with his mom that is, like, not, that is, like, super, hyper superficial. Um, and also it makes it... It makes a bunch of scenes doubly sad, like, for example, the scene where Dasong is looking out the window and while the housekeeper's being fired, because that's really his mom that, that's being fired. Oh. Uh, and, like, the housekeeper is, like, texting with Dasong, and that's how he knows that they went out 
like on camp on a camping trip, and Da Sung is like crying during the camping trip to try to try to extend it to give the housekeeper more time. Uh, oh. But also, Da Sung gets home and like doesn't know about like doesn't think that the housekeeper is there, but also can't sleep in the house for some for whatever reason, just because he's like a kid. But there's this there's this very subtle implication that like Da Sung is undergoing all of this like emotional upheaval. Um, and there's a bunch of lines about how the family misses the ribs that the uh, that the uh, housekeeper used to cook. Uh, so it's it's like there there's all of these like little moments of the family, the poor family, like materially like kind of harming the rich family's like way of life uh, that culminates in like this sort of this sort of weird like emotional trauma for the son who is just kind of selectively being cared for. So good. I didn't even it's pick a up on the dynamic. Movie. I didn't even pick up on the dynamic of the kid. The the scene Mom of like when when the stuff. when uh the son gets there in the first part and the 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 maid has to go outside and wake the mom up and literally has to like clap in her face yeah. <laughs> to get her up. Like she's just fucking passed out on the front yard. Like is so it's so good. And I love it too because it's like the thing that they reveal is that like the it's not like the mom is working. Yeah. Like, the mom just has a housekeeper, and the husband is like, oh, it's because she's a terrible cook and, like, doesn't know how to clean. Yeah. The, every single scene of, like, him coming home, she's, like, laying on the couch, or she's just, like, sleeping, ar- like, just, like, it, sleeping around the house. She's, like, she's like, a very, she's a real, like, feminine mystique yeah, situation. Absolutely. Like, it definitely, the actress definitely comes off as if, like, the character is supposed to implicitly just, like, be fucked up on benzos or drunk all the time which also makes their whole bit of being scandalized by the idea of drugs really funny uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> um i really like the doc uh the 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 hacker daughter's actress and mm. like her her character is just like pitch perfect like there's so yeah. many people are like oh you need to see parasite because it's a good movie and also i already know which character is going to be your favorite uh-huh yeah uh ki jung uh who's played by park Sodam, uh is the best character in the film uh, by an absolute long shot um, and a true powerhouse performance uh, in in every sense of the word. Uh, every scene with her is an absolute joy um, and her touch is felt throughout the movie in, in ways that aren't really even so much explicitly explained. Uh, for example, the care. Uh, the care, if you remember, is is their like fake company that they make. Yeah. Uh, where Kitek hands the this like really fancy looking business card back to uh, Mr. Park in the car. And Mr. Park looks at it and literally says, well, this is a really good business card. This is really high class. Yeah. Which kind of calls to calls to mind all of this historical precedent of like the higher class just co-opting the poor, the lower classes like art. Uh, because like she's an artistic person throughout the movie. Like she's She's using Photoshop to forge documents. And they, like, they state that, like, like when she's doing that, they're like, how did you not get into art school with this? Yeah, she's absolutely. Just, she's just kind of like, oh, shut up. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, by the way, my favorite art, my favorite artistic touch in the movie, by far, is the burner phone with the custom phone case that says The Care on it. Yeah, that's... Fucking I love that bit. unbelievably genius. And her just picking up the phone and, like, running into the bathroom and just, like, doing her nails and just, like, doing this funny fake voice, like... Basically making fun of the rich family in, like, every single moment that she's, like, on the screen. Her... The the parts where she's just, like, obviously, like, bullshitting. Like, oh, we're going to need these documents. Which are not documents a place like that would ever request. Yeah. (laughs) But, like... We need the title to your land. But, like, (laughs) both, like, she doesn't know that and also the mom doesn't know that. Because the mom (laughs) also doesn't know how the fucking world works. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah, and, and... I loved all of her little interactions with uh, the rich mom, uh, Yun Kyo. I-, I really liked her interactions with her, where, like, uh, Yun Kyo would, like, say something in English, uh, or would just, like, say something kind of weird, and Ki Jung would just have this, like, really, really subtle acting tick of just, like, kind of raising her eyebrows, where it's, like, you kind of see in the back of her mind, you see that, like, oh, you just... oh. You just said something kind of like weird and awkward and inhuman, and I don't really know how to react to that. But yeah. I'm just I'm just gonna smile at you because, <laughs> like, the specifically the part where she's like, "I'm deadly serious," and Ki Jung is just like, 
what? <laughs> Why are you acting like this? Why are you like this? The, oh, the whole scene with the, like, ah, uh, this is the schizophrenic corner. And then afterwards, they're like, how did you convince her? And she's just like, oh, I just Googled art therapy and, like, <laughs> yeah. bullshit. And, like, learned what random terms in it is. Like, she straight up admits that, like, she doesn't even know what the word she used really means. Yeah. She's just like, these are terms that are used in art therapy. I did notice now that you pointed it out, or, like, I thought about it. Because, like, I was always like, oh, the, I like that, like... She has, like, a dynamic with the, the the rich son that's never really, like, shown too heavily, but it's sort of implied to be very caretaker almost. And that makes sense that it's like, oh, he, like, immediately starts imprinting on her yeah. and not his actual mother because now she's the person who's, like, spending time with him and, yeah. like, playing with him. The person who's around. Yeah, because, like, like, he has the little thing where he's, like, super excited to, like, save her from Indians and stuff. There's the scene where the mom comes in and they're just sitting in his tent and she's like sitting on his lap mm-hmm. uh, while he's like while he's drawing and stuff. That I, I remember seeing that scene and being like, oh, that's like not what I expected. Like I expected their dynamic yeah. would be she'd walk in and she's just kind of like letting him do whatever and is like doing her own stuff. But it's like, oh no, she's like actually kind of like being present for this child in a way that probably actually is good for him. Yeah. She just doesn't know what the fuck she's talking. She's just making shit up about what she's talking about. Yeah. Abs- there's this, there's this thing throughout the movie where they're like this weird contrivance where it's like, they, they basically are doing their job, but because, because of the sort of disbelief of like the sort of class separation, there's this like weird grief about like, Oh, rich people are so stupid. And then they're also like, do, do we need to do this other thing? Should we be doing this other thing? Should we be covering our bases? Should we all be working in the same house? Like, all of this sort of thought that just kind of bubbles up. And um, it's kind of crucial. Uh, and I, I, I do want to use this to, like, jump off and talk about a specific scene that I think is great uh, and really funny, uh, where, um, like, it's obvious that Kiwu is, like, actually... He, like, actually knows English, and he's actually, like, tutoring the rich daughter to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, but... Well, he has all this context of Min, uh, uh, who's, like, his rich friend, Min's relationship with this uh, girl that he's tutoring. Uh, and the, and he all of a sudden talks to the rich mom, and he gets this idea that she really likes Min, in spite of the fact that his daughter's grades are shitty. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it becomes apparent to the son that, like, the, the thing is not... The thing to do here is not to impress his English-speaking ability onto the wife. It's to make the daughter like him. Yeah. And to manipulate her. Uh, so, like... He, like, he immediately just kind of, like, swoops in and is just like, you need passion and vigor. <laughs> like, it's so, that scene is so weird. Because it's like, so when that scene started, because, like, I, I knew that there was going to be some big thing in the film. And I thought that one of them was going to be that, like, oh, the English tutor job is basically being a male prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I thought that was going to be the twist. Is that, like, oh, she's actually basically hiring you to, like, fuck her daughter. Right. Uh, which, and, which she kind of is. <laughs> which, like, to an extent. But, like, she but doesn't think that she is. Yeah, no. It, but it is, yeah, it's, it's exactly what you said, where it's, like, it's he, he definitely actually knows how to tutor her in English. But it's very clear that, like, the thing that Min recommended him for, which is, like, hey, you actually do know English. Yeah. You just, like, are really bad at like getting into the university. But, like, you know what's on the exams. Like, you could, you, like, it's very obvious that Min is earnestly recommending him this job in a thing where it's like, you th- have the skill set to do this. And then he gets there and basically finds out that skill set that like makes you a good fit for this job doesn't matter. Right. What yeah. they want is credentials that look real and they want the sense that they're getting what they're paying for. Yeah, and they want so the you have to be happy. Yeah, so th- that you have to play off this like professorly tutor who makes their daughter happy. Yeah. Vibe. And it has nothing to do with whether or not you're actually good at teaching her how to speak English. Absolutely. Which totally, which like really leads to the scene of the daughter all of a sudden having a huge issue with like, mom, you didn't make me japagri. Like, you, yeah, you made it for, you made it for someone else and you didn't even ask me. You didn't even think. How dare you? You're a fucking bitch. Like <laughs> that, that's kind of just shows what their dynamic is where it's just like this, like absolute permissiveness of like, oh no, I just want to make my kids happy. And I, I like if, if if your daughter is failing in school, but she's like, no, no, I want to keep my tutor. I, my tutor is good. And and the rich mom's like, all right, you know what? Fuck it. And is just like permissive of that. And then that, that just kind of shows off in their dynamic. Oh, God. I didn't even think about it. Because I forgot that like the, it's mentioned that the daughter's grades were not well, good. Yeah. It does make me wonder then if the whole setup they have of uh, the mom being like, oh, the art tutors are constantly. The son is constantly driving away. Art tutors has more to do with the mother. 
<laughs> and, and, and not the actual child. Yeah, because it seems like it seems like the the big the sister like is pretty decent at taking care of the kid. Yeah, which to me suggests that like he's not actually that difficult to deal with. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's just a kid who likes to draw, and you just gotta like pat him on the head and be like, "Good drawing." Yeah, but of course, <laughs> but of course, because it, because it's this mom character, he's fucking Basquiat. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which. Really loaded reference, like I, super loaded. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I love when they drop that reference. I'm like, oh, that is like, it doesn't matter how talented your kid is, he's not that. No, like <laughs> he did. Like the thing about Basquiat's art is that he went through like a full life of artistic development and like actually experiencing life before and, like he severe on poverty. It. Yeah. <laughs> One of the first lines that the housekeeper says uh, is like. Uh, Kiwu calls her, like, Madame or something, uh, and she's like, oh, pff, I just work here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, just the fun. <laughs> uh, another thing I noticed in terms of the, the, the echoing and paralleling on that kind of stuff is the, um, when they're downstairs in the basement the first time, mm-hmm. the, the housekeeper keeps calling her sis. Yeah. And it's very obviously, like, we're, solidarity, like, we're in this together. Yeah. And then later that's echoed. When the mom is talking to the other mom, and she just starts calling her sis. Yeah, absolutely. And it's an it's such an obvious moment of like we're I'm calling we are we are solidarity, and the mom obviously being taken back into like oh wait, I am I'm one of you now. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Like that scene has that whole sequence really, and kind of in the center, like the center point of the film, just has this huge tangle of like imagery and concepts about like what a family entails and like how these people are like kind of trying to like draw comparisons and also be separate from each other and like the way the way that like the things that are kind of influencing them uh i thought that actress the actress from moon gong uh that character her like north korean newscaster impression was very funny oh i forgot about that yeah that was, <laughs> that was an incredibly funny scene jumping back to uh japagari uh they so they, they translate it. Um, this is an article that I think got put in like the LA Times where they talk about Ramdan, uh, which there's a part in the movie where um, if, you, if you're reading the English subtitles, the mom... Sorry that I've like read so fucking... No, much. no, it's good. I'm, like, it's, it's, this is exciting. Listen, it's, it's rare that we get to do, have a movie that gets us so excited that we actually read up on it right, right after. Yeah. It's fun. I think, yeah. I think this... <laughs> This is this is why the show is called Processes. Is yeah, it's we're us processing. processing the fucking movie. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like especially with like whenever we do foreign language films, it's always nice to to read a bit more on them because there's there's always context that we're just not going to have. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and case in point, um, there the, it was translated as Ramdan as this sort of portmanteau of ramen and udon, uh, but the actual the actual like thing in in South Korea is chapagri because it's a uh, it's noodles from two different brands one of the brands is like chapagetti and like the other one is neoguri uh and um there's this beautiful bong joon ho quote about uh how well first of all the the uh poor family's mother uh chung chung suk uh she has no fucking idea what she's talking about when she says japagari she's like what the fuck is japagari yeah like the the poor family has never had that because it because they've always had to choose between uh chapagetti or neoguri. Oh, uh, okay. And furthermore, the choice of sirloin steak is so fucking unsubtle and so funny. <laughs> and so like such an adolescent like political cartoon choice, but it's also just like it, it's like such an incredibly like tense scene uh and it's just this like great funny sort of like class commentary thing that's like super obvious i i wonder if the point of Ra- of translating as ramdan like ramen and udon is because to an english-speaking audience that connotates more the idea of fusion food yeah. yeah and i wonder if that was why they translated it that way was to get across this idea of like this is fusion food so you know that this is a type of dish that is two things that are normally cheap or fine on their own mm. combined for no reason and costs too much money and is popular with rich people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which like Japagri in real life is, it, it's something that's like common uh, among all different classes, essentially. Like it's like poor people, poor people technically do eat Japagri, uh, but 
it is still this like it, it still does call that to mind of like all of this like weird contrivance of just like why why both like yeah to, like sure that I guess it makes sense but like also like it, it it like kind of hints toward this like notion of food culture as being like mostly about luxury mm. and mostly about getting ingredients to your country that have never once been able to grow in your country and who gets to eat those things uh it, you know like it, it absolutely and, and it could just be a delightful little snack for your son because yeah. he's sad that his camping trip didn't work out and she she uses sirloin and the mom is just like oh i guess he doesn't want it i don't know do you want it who wants it i guess i'll eat it that's Fuck so it. funny oh like, <laughs> i love that the daughter's upset that she didn't even ask her if she wanted it mm-hmm. which implies like a further weird dissonance between the mother and her kids where she's just like who do I offer this to? Well, who's in the room with me right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Speaking of uh, returning very briefly, yeah, this is one of the best edited trailers I've ever seen Strongly because of agree. how many scenes it takes from the movie and decontextualizes them, but gets across the same gist without showing anything that would spoil the movie. Yeah. The closest is I believe they do show the blood on the cake. Um, yeah, they show, like, blood splattering on the bread and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, but it's, like, that's also kind of, like, I feel like when you're watching this movie, you're kind of expecting something like that to happen at some point. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's also, they also, in the trailer, show the scene with the hot sauce on the pizza. Yeah, they So do. they leave it kind of ambiguous as to what, if it's blood or not. Yeah, or, like, what's happening that's causing the blood and, like, yeah, I, I, I really, I, I really do have to hand it to the trailer editor because it, it carries a, a YouTube comment, like, that I happen to agree with kind of put it perfectly where it's just like, this is a good trailer. It doesn't tell you what happens in the movie, but it tells you what the tone of the movie is and it tells you what you're in for. Exactly. And similarly, it's also an incredible trailer because it is just like the movie. It has a very strongly different first half and second half. Yeah. Uh, and, and we're talking about like the main, um, I, don't, I don't know how I would cite it, but like the main official trailer, maybe I'll put it in the description or something. Um, it's, it's specifically you want the second one because something that I noticed is that they had put out two yeah. and the initial one uh, was very badly translated. Yeah. Like you can compare the subtitles and like lines are completely different and like v- hit very differently. And the second one, there's lines in that trailer that are in the actual movie. Absolutely. Uh, I'm trying to remember which one jumps up. There's, like, one really specific one. It's, like, when she's interviewing him for the job. It's, like, something she says just, like, vi- connotates very differently in the first trailer than it does in the second trailer. Yeah. And there's also, like, them looking at the art. And, like, the line Yokshi has been translated in, like, 20 different ways. Yeah. Like, between different trailers. So it's kind of just, like, eh. You know, but it's it. The actual editing of the trailer is really good. The, the use yeah. of like the scene of chopping up meat really frantically, uh-huh. uh, which does convey the stress of that scene, but kind of implicitly implies more goriness. The scene of the mom coming up the stairs and looking horrified, which is like actually in the comedy half of the film, but they like edit it in to look like it's from the second half of the film. Yeah, there's so many just like brilliant touches in the trailer where they don't give away any of the big plot beats of the film. But they perfectly capture the like stress, like the, the way the film goes from like a quirky comedy to like a very stressful, like <laughs> everything goes fucking wrong in the worst way. An extremely stressful, extremely violent, quirky comedy. Yeah. <laughs> a sort of quick side note: another beautiful overlap between Barking Dogs Never Bite and Parasite is humans eating expensive gourmet dog food. <laughs> I forgot. I that scene was so funny. Just like, what yeah, am I eating? And it's like it's a dog treat that was introduced earlier in the film. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And uh, another another thing that I'll kind of toss back towards our general like fam- family discussion is that like there is a moment where like during the scene where it's like, don't call me sis, don't call me sis. Yeah, sis, sis. Like, uh, there's also. Kind of, kind of a lot about how people are incentivized to distance themselves from each other in that scene uh, that is also kind of culminated in, or that also kind of culminates in Kitek going, don't call me dad, we're being filmed. Yeah. Like, stop calling me dad. Uh, which is just, ugh. Like, the ways, this movie does such a good job illustrating the ways in which kind of capitalism really wants you to distance yourselves from everything and everybody. From family, from other people of your class. Yeah. From And, and like, that's the thing about that's great about it, too, is because, like, the main reason why she's like, oh, I'm going to call the cops on these people who, like, she really doesn't have to call the cops on. And she probably would have been better off if she was, like, not honest about why she was there, 
but like was more like hey your situation sucks but i can't like take this kind of a risk but i'm willing to like help yeah. Um, but it's like, you know, the, the, the red alert thing is like, if these people are here, that's going to cause the family to look closer on what's going on. Uh, yeah, definitely. Like that, that, is, and like that is, yeah, that is like capitalism. It encourages you to distance yourself where it's like, I can't have these poor people here because their behavior might reveal like similarities that we share, which would give away like what I need to do to survive. Yeah. And I think, um, Kind of, kind of using Bong Joon-ho's quote as like, we all live under the same country of capitalism, which he literally said, which I think is, uh, mwah, love you, Bong Joon-ho, uh, which is um, that they are, every single character is so incentivized to like misinterpret and misunderstand what relationships mean and what they are because the illness of capitalism is that you have to spend every waking moment of your fucking life determining value of your decisions. It's like, it... It's it's not really quite as simple as just oh I I am going to make this decision and I have to like think about the you know gains and losses in in, in necessarily a normal way it's just like oh I have to like think about things that in other in like any other situation I wouldn't have to think about like for example the the relationship between the housekeeper and Dasung like is that a real mother son relationship in, like in a surrogate sense or is it just her treating the kid as job security yeah, manipulating him, in the same way that, uh, in the same way that Kiwa man- manipulates uh, the rich daughter, like that's what our brains are now, like period, and and the the way the movie illustrates it, and the way the the way that it like damns and also apologizes for the actions of specifically, I would I want to say the poor family. Oh, and I just realized that that ties in too, where it's like, what is the nature of their dynamic and stuff? Yeah, that also ties to the fact that the kid is traumatized by her husband. Yeah, absolutely. Like, that that's a further... Because, like, she knows. Like, there's no way she doesn't know that, like, the ghost he saw coming out of the basement was her husband coming out not knowing that there was anyone in the kitchen. Yeah, absolutely. So she's fully aware that, like, this kid has, like, a weird trauma issue around God. basically something that she is responsible for. I just... I, I love the subtle textures of, like... They, there's literally a line that's like, they say a ghost in your house brings wealth, which, in the context of Bong Joon-ho's entire filmography, is the most chilling line yeah oh like and so on the nose that it's like they say that having something in your home that you are able to render invisible and like push away will make you more successful something like, that, something that literally is there to control your lights to make you feel important as you're coming up the stairs yeah absolutely <laughs> like that like it's part and parcel the way that rich people don't see labor and don't understand labor and like this whole scene of the mom being like, oh, we have this plan for this table formation and you got to do it, but you got to stay quiet because the kid's sleeping uh, and you got to drive us all around after not sleeping all night. Isn't the basement he's into like for hiding from the IRS? Yeah. Like no, it's original, like it's original thing was basically like, this is where you would hide uh, your wealth. <laughs> this is, yeah, this, this is where you would hide if there's like a war or, you know, if the debt collectors come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Like, that's that's kind of the whole point. And it's like, the it's being used for its intended purpose, but everyone's just like, oh my god, yeah. you're so sick. How, oh, uh, you sick bastard. Like, the movie does a little bit to kind of um, make the squatter character a little bit abject. His, there's his, like, obsession with wealth, which is so complicated and so tough to unpack. Uh, there's him being, his, like, his literal praising of Park as if he's, like, his, uh, like, a master. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, it's more important to this man who's dying on the ground to be, like, to tell Mr. Park that he respects him than it is to, like, do anything else. Like, it's, it's so chilling, but it, it it's also kind of, you know, sublimated by the scenes of him having these, like, man and wife scenes with, uh, Moon Gwang, uh, the housekeeper, the original housekeeper in the house. Like, using, like, they're, spe- they're always shown as being, like, they, the, the, especially the flashback scenes where they're, like, we're the ones who feel the architectural focus of Namgun, who, who, like, made this house. Like, we're the ones who, uh, you know, danced in the living room. And it's, like, they're using the house for its intended purpose. Nobody else is. And they're the ones that get fucked. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, and so, and, and so there's this, like, further texture of wealth being treated as, like, a curse and the die, and, like, the dying words of Moon Gwang in the basement, like, 
casting this sort of curse over the family and like all of this rain and like all of the shit that happens to their house and like it makes you think that it's not gonna give that amount of depth to these characters and then it really goes all in and like and it's it's it literally just feels like this broken family just casts a curse on everybody who lives above them and 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 it's it doesn't do them any good but it also you know at least it's the situation has changed and the idea that, like, uh, to pass on to, like, the haunting thing, you know, like, they mentioned, like, oh, it's hard to sell a house like this where something terrible happened because, and the implication is because it's assumed to be haunted. Uh, and then, it, like, it, it basically is. Like, yeah. It, like, like, yeah, actually, the killer lives in the house. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. I suppose now would be as uh, good a time as any to um, start talking about uh, Song Kang-ho's character, uh, Kim ki Um Song Kang-ho, if you've never seen him in a film before, um is the greatest actor doing it. Uh, uh, who, who else has he played? He's play, He's been in uh, The Host. He's been in Memory. He played the dad in The Host. Okay. Uh, the blonde dad. Um, he played uh, a detective in Memories of Murder. He was in uh, Thirst uh, by Park Chan-wook as a sexy vampire. That's where I know him from. Yeah. Because I was like, I was like, I, I, I was like, I know he's, I don't think he's an old boy, but I've definitely seen him in some movie before. No, he's, he, but I forgot that I've seen Thirst. He had, he had a bit part in Lady Vengeance, which I think is cute. Uh, he had, um, he was also in Snowpiercer, which is oh. probably, probably another film that you've seen him in if, if you're, you know, into movies or whatever. But like, uh, he's kind of, he's virtually unrecognizable just because he's like covered in facial hair and like he's super ratty. It, it's, it's, very cute, though, that um, him and his daughter from the host rep- reprise their roles. I thought that that was so, uh, so fun. And do so they have, like, it. a cameo in it? Is it, like, uh, the same characters, basically? Or? No, they're not the same. They're they're much different characters. And, and Song, Kang, Song Kang-ho's the strength as an actor. Um, it's something, actually, that John Hurt said about him before John Hurt passed. And it's actually something I super agree with. Uh, which, in his words, he put it that uh, Song Kang-ho comes from nothing and is able to give you everything. Uh, okay. uh, and I think I think that like the the it, you, when you see him, it's a signature Song Kang-ho performance. Uh, but he does something different in every single role that he does, uh, and he he changes how he looks and he changes how he acts, and it's like that, it's still that man, but he's an incredible method actor. Um, and uh, the thing that I notice him doing uh, as an actor that I think needs to be highlighted and, and really focused on is his uh, the character work that he does with his body. Um, because in The Host, it's it's this like bright hair. In Snowpiercer, he's just like, it's less his hair, less about his hair and more about his fists in, yeah. in a sense. In Parasite, he crucially uh, uses his eyes uh, in a lot of different ways throughout the movie. Um the the main thing he does is when something bad happens, he closes his eyes. Uh, and and that, I think, kind of links back to the scene where he's... It links to the scene where he's speaking to his son, Kiwu, and talking about how, man, what's the fucking point of a plan? The best when, plan is no plan. Because no then plan it can't at all. go right. It yeah. Can't, yeah, or it can't exactly. go wrong. Yeah, and in that scene, he's literally covering up his eyes with his arm. Oh. Uh, so like there's just a lot of stuff that is just like he's this character who for whom a lot of stuff is just too painful there's also the beautiful shot that i think was like one of the best shots in the movie where he's driving um the rich mother and the sun comes out and blares on him and he and he winces and you see it in his eyes and and it's just like all of these incredible like tiny tiny character moments that culminate in the whole of a character who is kind of blocking things out by necessity but at the end of the movie we have a lot of like really close shots of him looking at everything that is happening yeah and and then it's it's him seeing the guy cover his nose because he smells yeah like a poor person exactly he he sees the guy cover his nose he sees the guy being like my son's gonna die in 15 minutes your son's not gonna die in 15 minutes yeah uh the, the, like the fact that they immediately don't care about the woman who got stabbed and yeah. they have no re- and like you know from their perspective it's like they don't know that that's his daughter like they don't know of that that's not. why yeah. he's upset yeah uh, but even then it's like you know to them they care more like, and it's like there's a reason they care more about their son but it is very much like they're being melodramatic their yeah. son is not going to die uh the woman with a knife in her is <laughs> yeah absolutely um and and you really see it in the way the movie plays out where Kitek is kind of the character that has the most to lose he has been through a zillion jobs. 
uh, they, they talk about it in the movie, like, when you worked as a driver, did you drive any Benzes? Not when I worked as a driver, but when I worked as a valet, yeah. So yeah. it's like, that's that's two jobs off the top, but that's like on top of all the other ones that we know about. Uh, and it's just like all of this endless hustling that he's had to do throughout his life. Like, his kids are able to be cr- like a little bit more wild and a little bit more daring about their aspect of the scam or, yeah. whatever, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but to him, like, there's all these scenes of him, like, nervously looking back at Mr. Park and just like, yeah, no, you call, call the care, hire my wife, uh, not my wife, uh, just kidding, uh, H- yeah. Him having to literally practice the script, like, nobody yeah. else having a script, but him having to have a script to do the performance. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so his character is, like, the most sort of anxiety prone and everything kind of comes down on his head, at, like kind of the hardest in in a sense not necessarily the hardest out of anybody in the movie certainly the person that got it the worst is the housekeeper yeah uh, the original housekeeper but like he's he is the one that has to see it and has to witness it and has to kind of go through it and with regard to that scene where they're practicing the script uh bong joon ho said it in an interview specifically that uh in korea that scene is literally like watching ansel elgort direct al pacino <laughs> like, that, like that's the feeling of that scene and the, like that's true Song Kang Ho is like a big fucking deal and the the other actor he's just like this really 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 good up and comer uh, oh so, okay yeah so it's like doubly funny in that regard that like his character in this film is like so nervous and feels so fucked all the time and it's there's just so many there's just yeah there's a lot of layers I, I love that kind of stuff L- like weird layering of like you know the the meta joke of of who these characters are played by yeah yeah um, absolutely somewhat similarly into like i think a, a detail that i really liked and it took me like i think a few days after i saw it to kind of process it was like there's like multiple at least two that i can know off the top of my head where he acts where he's asking park He's just talking to him about him. And this is related to Park being like, oh, he gets close to cross the line, but he doesn't cross it. Yeah. Where he's like, ah, but you do it because you love your wife. Or he's like, oh, you must really love your wife. And he just, he never says anything. He never responds to it. Or he just goes like, oh, keep driving. Or he's like, oh, just, he's like, I pay you to do your job. He literally says like, yeah, love. We'll call it that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, and yeah, and then in the scene at the party, he's just like, like where he's kind of like starting to realize just like how fucked park is yeah as in like in like an exploitative like just kind of like is not is not a person in the way you think he's a person way yeah uh where he's like he says like oh it's like you must really have your wife and he's like hey listen i'm paying you to be here yeah like at me is like don't get like don't try to be friends with me like we're not friends like i'm your employer i am paying you to do this for me yeah like this is your job like i am reinforcing both your status but i love that it's always around that because i think to him that's so upsetting because it's very, very heavily shown that, like, he loves his wife. Mm-hmm. Like, not Park. Um, uh, the dad. Kitek, yeah. Kitek, yeah. He loves his wife. Because there's, like, that scene where, like, they act as if they're going to hit each other. And then the mom just doesn't react. Yeah. And then they both start laughing. And she's just, like, and she's just straight up says, like, if I thought you were going to actually hit me, your ass would be dead. <laughs> <laughs> she's just flat out. She's, like, and, like, it's very obvious. Like, oh, this is, like, they do the thing that, like, a lot of our, our couple friends do where they have, like, joke arguments absolutely where it's like you know like maybe maybe things are a little tense or something but they just like overact it to like get the tension out and then they laugh about it and then they talk about whatever they're actually upset about yeah um, which that that scene is really textured to me I, I, yeah no we, we can return to that scene but i like that because it's like that I, I just look at that moment because like that's a moment of like true friendship bonding yeah where they can do something that is basically just there to scare the shit out of the kids and then they're like this is basically a joke between us Absolutely. Um, and so I think to him, like, that's why, like, it changes so much of his dynamic to Park. is because, like, he's repeatedly trying to get Park to be like, yeah, I love my wife. And he's like, why can't you say that? <laughs> like, what, like, what, like, excuse, hello? What the fuck is happening? <laughs> yeah, like, what, like, what is your relationship to your wife? Yeah. I- <laughs> Crucially, there is a scene at the end where he is in the basement. Uh, Kitek is in the basement crying and saying, I'm sorry, Mr. Park. And staring at this, like wheat pasted like, yeah. thing from the previous guy where, where he's like it, it's just this moment of just like man like yeah I guess you really did kill another person like it there is like just you sense a lot of grief of like how, why did this have to happen like why did all, why all of this shit yeah uh, and um, returning to the domestic violence joke scene <laughs> uh, my my th- feeling about that scene is that crucially like you don't they're drunk but you don't see the kids really react 
they kind of are just like, hey guys, come on, quit it. And the wife doesn't react at fucking all. Uh, which to me is this like kind of complicated thing where it's it's not so much implicating one partner over the other as being potential of potentially like domestically violent. Uh, it just it's this like tinge of like the in the in the beginning scene of the movie you see a shot of uh, the wife uh, Chung Sook. Uh, she has like a bunch of she she has like a medal from doing like sports or something like that, and you see her kind of like gingerly kick key tick and like hey wake up asshole we're i know fucking, you're pretending to sleep you're pretending to sleep we're fucking broke dickhead go get us some money go come up with what's your fucking plan now jackass and like that like melts away when their stress melts away and they're able to joke about it but during like the original stressful situations it like they're almost incentivized and pushed toward this like level of domestic violence with each other like not even not even like you know, obviously we live in a society and men do that shit to women more. Yeah. But the the point that but the point the point that Bong is making here is more like when when you stop f- feeling the unbelievable immense pressure of poverty, that's when that can be a joke. And it it is not so much a joke when you are actually dying. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean like it's 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 no coincidence that like, you know, domestic abuse rates are higher amongst horror families yeah like it has nothing to do with some innate character of them it's that when you are under the duress of poverty the worst tendencies of human behavior come out yeah absolutely and i feel like that's yeah i think that's a big part of it is that it's like you know it's like it it sort of mirrors the bit of like uh park and his wife role-playing uh being scummy drug dealers and drug addicts right where it's like because they aren't stressed out he can joke about being so stressed out that he's going to beat his wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. Um, but it's like, it's like I said, it's like, that's, there's that element to it. And it's like I said, it's like, I liked it. Cause it's like, it, it shows a moment of them knowing each other so intently that in a scene that to the outsider perspective is like, Oh shit. He's, he's like, he's, he's like a monster. He's this. She's like, no, no, he's not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, he's not. He's fucking doing a bit. <laughs> he's he's a, yeah, I can kick this guy's ass. Yeah. Just, <laughs> I, I forgot that she was a sports star, which makes that line especially funnier, where she's just like, oh, I thought you were going to actually do it. I'd lay your ass out. Where she's yeah. just like, she's like, no, no, no. I could kick your ass. <laughs> like, yeah. like, don't get, don't get it twisted. <laughs> yeah. I, I got the feeling there, there's this really beautiful, um, sort of character, character work, uh, thing where I, I kind of feel like Chung Sook is like the 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 son ki is like a mama's boy and like ki jung is like daddy's girl kind of situation where like each each of them is more like like the the mom is like the son and the son is like the mom and vice versa with like the daughter and the dad yeah uh but there's they kind of flip flop back and forth between like who takes it who they think takes after who um but it it it, it I I my supposition is that it kind of becomes clear that like ki jung takes after ki tech and uh ki woo takes after chung sook a little bit um, especially, which makes it doubly tragic that Kite has all of this sort of projecting to do on Kiwu about like, oh, you have a plan now. Yeah. Whereas Kiwu is just like, no, I don't really have a plan. I'm just a manipulator, <laughs> which is kind of how Chung Sook is. Uh, and uh, interestingly, all of, also about Chung Sook, uh, the last scene in the movie is um, he he comes home and he like starts trying to decode the Morse code se- uh, message from his dad, and Ch- Chung Sook is like stuck in the other room coughing oh which is the a fumigation troubling texture yeah <laughs> uh and and just like really crushingly sad that like and it just shows this crushingly sad separation of this family um and and how things just kind of get worse and worse and worse uh which is tough <laughs> and I, yeah, you know, I, I didn't think about that either until we were just talking about it now. But like, yeah, it's like, it's like, you know, he projects onto the son, um, you know, the plan, you have a plan. But like, the daughter comes up with the plans. Yeah. Well, they, I mean, like, they, he, they kind of all go back and forth in coming up with plans, but like, the, yeah. the daughter is really the glue holding the family. She, she, yeah, she's the architect of the original scam, as it were. Cause like, when he's like, are we moving to that stage already? She's like, I've already set it up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's the scene right, right before she goes in, she, like, practices her backstory and stuff real quick, mm-hmm. which is very clear that she's, like, put more thought into it than he did. Yeah. Like, right even down to, like, the way she performs her, her that her, like, delivery of all this stuff is very, like, professional and poised. And then in, like, the scene when he's laying the trap bait for it, he's like, 
like dramatically putting his hand on his cheek. He's like, what was her name? <laughs> Gosh, like like fucking Tim Heidecker and us. Just like yeah. that cartoonish level of just oh. like, oh, God. You know, I had someone perfect in my... Jessica, that's her name. <laughs> from Illinois. From Illinois. Like, <laughs> the, the least normal way of talking and acting. And then she shows up and it's like, oh, yeah. Like, the way she slowly puts that pressure on where she's like, your son would actually need a lot of help. So I'm going to need to do more sessions. And I need to let you, I need you to let me know if you're going to commit to that because I'm not going to waste my time if he's not going to be able to get the full art therapy that he needs. Yeah. Like, just that kind of power move, which is like, Oh, you know exactly how these people work. Like, yeah. you are willing to press your fucking luck because you're like, she's going to fucking give me the job. <laughs> Fuck <Yeah>. you. <laughs> <laughs> and there's there's also that scene at the beginning that, like, really kind of introduces their dynamics to each other where they're talking to the pizza the pizza place manager. Uh, and she's like... And, and the mom, like, has this, like, super hyper-emotional reaction. It's just like, you don't have a fucking brand. You can't afford a folder. Yeah. And then, and then like, the kid's just like, ah, oh, just trying to, like, sand, sand that over and be like, hey, can I have a job? And the, and the daughter, the, like, who who told you about the part time worker that we have who ditched us on the on the eve of this huge order? Oh, Ki Jung did. Yeah. And, and then she shows up and she's like, Yeah, that guy's really untrustworthy. I I love the way <laughs> she moves in that scene because yeah. she slowly moves behind the manager. She's so sneaky. Yeah. It's so beautiful. that way, like, the manager feels like literally boxed in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like I, lo- I love that scene. Just it, the, her, all their acting in that just plays out so much how they work together as a unit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, ki- kind of uh, looping. <laughs> also, the scene of them at the very start trying to find Wi-Fi and finding it in the bathroom, and then both climbing up onto the little toilet <laughs> shelf and just crouched on their phone using it is so good. Uh, yeah. Again, part of part of Bong Joon Ho's like kind of adolescent filmmaker touch is like you know but but like i i kind of i kind of appreciate it because i think he has this kind of ageless quality of just like he does the 13 year old film fan things but he also is like actually smart yeah (laughs) like so uh, i think that brings a lot of um a really wide berth to like what he does i i like it because it means it's I, I it's it, it fills a sort of void where it's like i feel like you could enter his enter into and see his films at sort of any level of like yeah, cinema appreciation. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think when any movie gets kind of parroted and talked about as a masterpiece, there's this inclination to be like to have a sort of uh, contradictory uh, opinion, which I feel a lot of the time when people are like this is the greatest movie ever, and I'm like, oh, it can't be that good. No, um, same. I I, I I often say that if I go into a movie that's super critically acclaimed, I usually expect to hate it, and it's not contrarianism. It's just that it's like. Whenever a movie is like that, I feel like it's because it's made for a very specific audience and that's who's reviewing it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so when when Parasite is referred to as a masterpiece, I think it's more useful to think of it as kind of a Spielbergian masterpiece than necessarily like, you know, an artful film. Like it, it is uh, a movie that knows it's a movie. It's a movie that you can eat popcorn at. Uh, it's a movie that you are la- going to laugh out loud at in the it, theater. Like, it's a movie that I took my dirtbag friends to, and they loved it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, uh, all of our dirtbag friends this love is, it. This is the thing I was talking about, I think, of you earlier, where it's like, it's it's so, I'm so, I feel so alienated. Oh, God, I hate that saying that. Like, it feels weird the way in which people stand for, I know we shit talk Marvel a lot, but like, Marvel stuff is just because it's like, my popcorn movies are like Parasite and Lighthouse. Like those yeah. are my those are my dumb dumb stupid movies. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And like, they're great movies. Like I, this isn't me shitting on them, but it's like it's like that is like that is kind of like my level of like this is a fun movie I'm gonna go see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's like the that's that's I feel I feel like I am having fun when I when I go to see like these dumb bullshit like big huge quote quote marks like artsy movies a24 uh, uh yeah but i mean of. i would i would almost really want to separate like bong jin ho is almost just his own canon no he really is yeah i feel like when, when i looked at the list of movies he had made i was like oh these are all like great films but like great films that you can also like probably get your parents to watch yeah like yeah. these are great films you would not be surprised to see on your parents dvd shelf unless you they were the kind of parents who are like reading a movie? Yeah, I... <sighs> We're going to talk about that a lot on the host episode, by the way. <laughs> we are going to talk about that a lot. I grew up with some of those. It's the same. <laughs> <laughs> and now we do a film podcast. Yeah. So <laughs> this is the last thing I have as far as my notes. Yeah. Um, And it's 
touches on the texture of the movie where uh, there's this sort of curse of wealth uh, or, or this idea of like wealth as a curse and poverty as being a ghost um, and, and how kind of like scary that is. Uh, a uh, One of the um, other filmmakers who's part of a modern canon uh, of exploring that theme is uh, Dan Bell, uh, who is this guy on YouTube who just goes to play, goes to <laughs> abandoned places and just films in them. And uh, it came out recently that a couple of his videos were faked. Uh, really? And, yeah. So, like, for example, there, like, a lot, it's just kind of this typical YouTube clickbait thing where, like, he's a guy who lives in a, a kind of, or, or rather, he spent a lot of time living in a kind of difficult area of Columbus where it's really easy to find things like flop houses. It's really easy to find things like, um, you know, townhouses that are like empty and used for uh, big quotes like drug deals. Uh, and in one video, he made fake, like, cocaine and put it in, like, this like, these little baggies and put it in, like, Tupperware. It's, like, co coke and heroin and all this stuff. Uh, and then he hears somebody outside, and they come inside, and they're yelling, and they're making a scene, and they're, like, trying to find him. And he's just, like, scream He's just, like, crying and trying to be quiet and, like, whispering, go away. And it's, like, a really... It's, like, technically from the perspective of what has of the actual film yeah which i'm gonna call it <laughs> the fictional film that was put on youtube um is like this is so scary what if this happened this is so scary what if you went into a homeless shelter and yeah. there are homeless people there <laughs> uh, yeah absolutely which parasite um plays with in an actual way that isn't just us uh, some Sorry, Dan Bell. Some, like, random American just making his... Like, clickbait bullshit. Clickbait bullshit. Like, I have mixed feelings about Dan Bell's uh, oeuvre in general. Um, I think overall he does good things. Uh, but, like, that kind of that kind of difficult, uh, like, tourism um, is touched on by Parasite, especially in uh, the, the Scholar's Rock and Ki Woo's relationship to the Scholar's Rock, which is really really treated heavy-handedly as a monkey's paw situation. Yeah. Um, Scholar's Rock, historically, they're most common throughout China. It's essentially you just, like, find a rock, usually made of limestone. You judge it based on a couple qualities. They're usually fucking huge. Or, well, they're not usually huge. They're all different sizes. Yeah. But some of them, especially ones that are put out on display, are, like, fucking big. Um, and uh, it is a... It, in the movie, it's, like... Oh, your rich friend just rolled through and gave us this really fucking weird gift that nobody gives to anybody else except for old people and and is like vaguely aware of how weird that gift is but also like kind of kind of doesn't really think about it and also like the mother uh character uh Chung Suk is is like very much like why didn't you just give us food? Yeah, like that scene that scene in, it does also play differently in Korea where that's just like a fucking weird gift. Uh and the way that it kind of follows him throughout the movie, it's it, and he calls it like metaphorical. He keeps he keeps saying the word metaphorical throughout the movie, but like the first time he uses it is when he's looking at the scholar's rock. Um, the 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 part where he's like, "Why are you still carrying that?" and he's like, "It's clinging to me." Yeah, and it's like coupled with his friend giving him the job that starts the events of the film. Yeah, absolutely. So he literally is giving him wealth as a curse. <laughs> Capital capitalism is literally a curse. Like. Him saying it's clinging to me when it's, like, obvious that he just has imprinted on this thing that is supposed to bring him luck. Yeah. Uh, but because of because of the sort of capitalist, like, valuation of every single choice and decision and second of your life, uh, he kind of feels like he has to hold on to it. Um, and it has all of this, like, obvious kind of import as, like, hints toward this history of, like, class disparity and, like, obsession and collecting rocks and... And uh, also, um, it's a fucking rock. Yeah, it's just uh, a rock. It's, it's just, just a, a big fucking rock. rock. But but it's part of the historical import of Scholar's Rocks is that they're, like, not so much haunted, but they resemble mountains and caves that, like, gods and, and ghosts and, and things like that live in. Um, so, it's it's this, like, in the past, this sort of imagined labor of, like, all of this history that's, like kind of planted on this rock being compared with like this current history of uh invisible labor uh and the and like the kind of confluence between high and low culture and the obsession uh 
of of this like these dispar th these classes which uh, with a huge disparity being completely obsessed with each other. Yeah. Um. I think that as a as a central focal point of the movie, I think the Scholars Rock is super like super effective and super cool. I think it's also interesting to like consider where it's like yeah he treats it as like luck essentially is like this will bring you things, but the thing that gets them wealth is just nepotism. Yeah, absolutely. He, he gets the job because his friend sets him up with it. He gets his family jobs by setting them up with them. Yeah. All of them are able to do their jobs, like, fine. Like, they're all good at their... Like, they're all good to decent at their jobs. Like, they can right. they can do it. But the only reason they even have the option is because they all vouch for each other. Yeah. Is because they make up a fake agency that vouches for them. Like, they literally get their jobs through sheer nepotism yeah and that's so and like he can't see that like he doesn't see it he's just like no this is because of the rock this is because of the luck that we have yeah absolutely and it calls it calls to mind all of bong joon-ho's idi like idiosyncratic kind of the, the way he visualizes wealth as being ultimately fucking meaningless yeah uh and like how yeah that's how anybody gets a job is just like someone recommended you and like and the, the level of class solidarity that's implicit in that. Yeah. Where it's like he's, you know, because he is poor, the people he's recommending and bringing into this job are also poor. Yeah. But the way he sells that nepotism is that they're not poor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, my sister would be great at this. Not because she's like, you know, an art student who knows what the fuck she's talking about and is talented. Yeah. But because she's in high demand. But because she's in high demand and she went to Illinois. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we have a driver who would be perfect for this. Not because he's like... Had 800 driving 800 jobs. 800 driving jobs. No, but because he's like... Uh, what, like what is it? She says he like he was like a celebrity driver older, or something. Older drivers are better, aren't they? Yeah, they're so much safer if, if it's just an old guy. Oh, their mom is a home homekeeper, and you basically just need someone who knows how to cook and clean and take care of your kids. Yeah. Well, we can't just recommend a woman we know who knows how to do those. No, she has to come from like a very high end agency for rich clientele. You're not buying labor. You're buying labor that makes you feel like you're buying uh luxury goods. Yeah. You're buying luxury labor. <laughs> yeah. And just yeah, like actual God. luxury goods, it's the same thing with a different label. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, it, and it just leads them to believe, it leads them to have all these complexes about like luck. And it's just like, oh, it's because of, it's because of luck and fortune and like oh, all this. But it's like, no, it's because of manipulation. Yeah. Uh, and it's because of the manipulation that you were incentivized to do. Um, so like, it, you know, it is what it is. But the, the whole scene where it's like, he has to like promise to himself like, no, I am going to get this degree for real. But it's like, you know, it's a it's a Gucci tag on a bag. Yeah. It's the same bag. Does it matter if it's the actual Gucci bag or not? <laughs> right, absolutely. I also realized another cool little parallel in it. We were talking about it earlier with the whole, the, the loss of plans. So the storm ruins two families' plans. Mm -hmm. It ruins um, the home of the poor family. Yeah. And their ability to successfully pass as not being poor. And it ruins the birthday party of the kid. <laughs> <laughs> so for them it becomes we have to stay in this like gym we have to do all this stuff we have to go through all of this effort and like deal with all this bullshit in order to continue to maintain our basic jobs and for the family it's we'll just have a party <laughs> <laughs> it's easy like it's i love how like that fits into the whole thing about like the best plan is no plan because yeah. if it goes wrong uh you know then it, it, it can't go wrong but it shows how much like the difference of what a plan going wrong means to both sides yeah. where to them a plan going wrong is just oh we'll just have a huge party tomorrow and for yeah. them a plan going wrong is we die <laughs> like yeah. two of us are dead like trying to trying to pick out like fancy lunch party clothes in a shelter from a garbage bag from a garbage bag yeah like which like i i love how it, it has there's um there's a really good movie. It's a horror-ish film called The Headless Woman, mm -hmm. which has very similar themes. The basic premise of the film is that a, a, a rich woman uh, hits something in her car and doesn't know if it's a dog, if it was a kid, Ugh. if it was a rock, and she doesn't know what to do, so she just keeps driving. And the rest of the film is basically about her slowly going crazy and being convinced that she must have hit and killed someone, but it never, her never getting a definitive answer. Damn. 
And the implication is that if she did hit and kill a kid, it was a poor, it was a poor, it was a poor child who basically like also does like labor, like a laborer's child and like a kid, oh, wow. like not full on child labor, but that kind of like, I'll mow your lawn for a dollar, but like in like a, a poorer country version of that. Like he's not yeah. like, he doesn't work in a factory, but like he's, it's ch- a child who like also does work to bring home like money to his family. Hmm. And there's a, there's a very similar scene in that, um, where there's both the scene where the poor family is taught like when she goes to buy vases from like one of the poor people and they mention um you know like oh the 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 floods happened last night and the canals hit the river and like whenever the canals flood like there's always a risk of someone drowning in them uh and they say like a line like oh the floods always like take away something every year um and then later when she's at her like with amongst like her elite someone says the same line but they're literally talking about how they had to cancel like a party damn (laughs) And it's like it, it like that that scene reminded me so much like when it plays out in Paris like because it's literally even the same thing of just like it rains too much and there's flooding but like what that means depends so much on what your material resources is. I yeah. really recommend Headless Woman. It's a really good movie. I, I say horror ish because it's more like I'd say like Hitchcockian thriller style. Right. But it's really just about like class as well but it's specifically about like you know this woman unraveling with guilt because like she's basically aware that she will get away with that if she did kill someone she's gonna get away with it a hitchcockian uh class focused thriller that sounds absolutely nothing like parasite how, <laughs> how fucking dare you bring that up i'm sorry I just, there was water in both of them so. <laughs> <laughs> no, that sounds fucking incredible. I actually really want to watch that. To return to you, you said another another person, uh, you mentioned Dan Bell. I straight up thought you were going to mention uh, Connor O'Malley. Oh my god. Uh, he, he's literally a dude who got his start going into places where rich people were and just making just like demonic cackling noises or just screaming yeah. at like wealthy people in New York. I like, it's like, even like now, like he has those videos about Howard Schultz where his whole thing is just playing this like, like a such like, arguably a caricature of like a crazy poor person but it's like it's a very specific embodiment of it where it's like he basically plays the basement guy from parasite yeah uh, that's his character as his character but like talking about how he wants howard schultz to be president and or to spit on him (laughs) (laughs) yeah i i think connor o'malley is really also exploring the same themes of like wealth obsession that bong joon ho is and i i really support him i support anytime he runs up to somebody sitting in a sports car and just goes and like just like i love you i love you give me all your money i love you i love you please 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 <laughs> please please look at me look at me the the, the last video he did of the howard schultz one where he's just holding like a like a selfie stick yeah. while in like the harbor yeah. and he's like he has it framed in a way where it looks like he's just in the middle of an ocean <laughs> it's so <laughs> funny all the ones where he just looks like darth maul yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, so fucking funny. Co- Connor O'Malley, I really want to hear your Parasite review, uh, legitimately. Um, and thank you for all of your anti-capitalist art. Thank you, everybody, for all I, of your I anti-capitalist sincere, art. I have no idea what Connor O'Malley's personal views are. He might not even have any. He doesn't seem, <laughs> he doesn't seem all there. Uh, <laughs> but I would legitimately say that like the things that make his pieces funnier is that it's class war because it's him in interjecting the most upsetting like visceral imagery and like sounds that like people associate with like crazy homeless people or poor people into any possible setting where rich people are yeah absolutely (laughs) and just him just openly saying like this is this is the evil desperation that you are breeding in the people who fucking do all the work that makes your lives comfortable fuck you a hundred fuck you howard schultz yeah yeah that's absolutely the art of um of Connor O'Malley. I think that like, it's, it's real, it's some real beautiful class fluidity to kind of just bike around New York city and just post like vines of rich people's faces. Like as you walk up to, as you walk up to them and you can see in the reflection that he is standing perfectly stock still, but just screaming, better than me. Yeah. You're better than me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, and that's where we're at as a country. So good luck everybody. Yeah. Uh, Bernie 2020. <laughs> Bernie 2020. Uh, Parasite. Hashtag Bernie 2020. Don't leave any comments about Elizabeth Warren. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> just vote. Just vote for Bernie. Just Elizabeth, come on the up. show. You're you're all so fucking annoying. Just fucking vote Bernie. You annoying fucking pedant pieces of shit. I hate all of you. Uh, but thank you so much for watching. <laughs> uh, and you're. I love all of you. And and, uh, and if you are leaving our Patreon because of that, uh, you know what. 
give that five bucks a month to uh, Bernie. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, go give your five bucks to Elizabeth Warren and her fucking Native American ass. Which, by the way, we, we're we not going to touch on that because this is an hour, 30 minute long uh, film critters all fucking ready. But man, that touch in Parasite. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Really, oh. Re- really. If we're really, if we want to talk about like something that is made invisible violently. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that I the the whole narrative of the sun just being obsessed with like cowboys and Indian stuff. Yeah, being like being a in fucking, a country that has never had being like, a Native indigenous American, Americans. <laughs> yeah, being a literal Native American otaku. Yeah, like her sister or his sister literally like says something about him doing like an artist cosplay and being like fake. Um, that's it's it's. Uh, it's so him, rough him because, literally having a TP in his room. Yeah, like Dasong, Dasong the son. Like you, you get a sense that he sees the disingenuousness and like the bullshit of his family and of the house and of the un, and like the absurdity of his situation, and that he kind of, and, and he's also able to see that like artistic value is kind of based off of like pain, but he's not. But he's also like being caged into this situation where he's never going to feel pain. Like even constructive pain, yeah, is going to completely pass him by. He's he has we, we talked about before. It's like he has he has a a, a unique wealth trauma of yeah. just like living in a family. He has that he has, he's he's gonna have like that kind of crazy rich kid brains uh-huh. where it's just it's like you grew up like extremely just like everything sanded down and circular, but like with no sense of like genuine human interaction. Yeah, and the only people who cared about you were literally being paid to do so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I the most traumatic thing you have is you think you is you think you saw a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which wasn't a ghost. By which the way. wasn't a ghost. It was a poor person. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's like we're not like yeah, let's fuck this eight year old kid. But it's like <laughs> the, the kid isn't real. Like I, well, I, <laughs> I mean, like it's it's not even so much of a like judgment of his character. It's the judgment it's of like, like the situations around him. Yeah. It's like you put a child in a situation and they're going to kind of imprint on like a lot of aspects of their situation and see a lot of aspects of their situation. And yeah, I don't, it's not necessarily that I think he has a specific feeling about the proceedings and about his, his family. It's just that like, he, he he's not really able to piece together. You, you see where his development is going. Like yeah. you see what the effects of the situation he's in are having on his development mm-hmm. of like, of like childhood. I really love that. He's like specifically not into cowboys and Indians <laughs> to the extent that even when they have the thing at the party, it's just like, he's the good Indian and we're the bad Indians. Yeah. <laughs> like there's just no cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause I mean like he, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't want to, uh, no rich person really wants to cop to being the cowboy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, no one wants to... Uh, be the cop of the Old West. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, no no one wants to be in that position where they're just, like, using all of this invisible labor and giving absolutely none of it back. Um, they just kind of want to see themselves as, like, yeah, no, I deserve this life. I worked hard. Uh, and and uh, I, I, worked, I worked so hard against all of those hard things that were preventing me from success. So we uh, we put up a poll on our Patreon that's actually over now, um, but we're, we're going to have a Patreon-exclusive uh, Film Critters Throws It Back, which is our throwback review series of movies that are that have already come out. Same, same thing as this. Uh, it's just us talking about older films that uh, oh. fans vote on. We do it every month. It's like a fun little like extra content thing, plus it yeah. gets us to you know watch more movies. For real. Again. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and this, this, I always this, like to do. This month is Bong Joon Ho. Bong Joon Ho is the host, which won our poll. Uh, yeah. We're going to be talking about the host. Um, so if you want to hear about that, if you want to hear about our thoughts on the dubbing wars of the two thousands, yeah. the the sort of the rickety uh, international promotion of the host, I would I would kind of characterize it as uh, much different from the trailers and like subtitle work on Parasite, which is all pretty pretty tip top. Yeah, but I'm really excited for that. Um, we're also going to be talking about the lighthouse here in a moment, but that will yeah. go up probably after this one. Right? Yeah, probably a couple days or something. Yeah, after. yeah, whatever. Um, uh, what would you rather else have spent my money on? Have spent. <laughs> this is this is a the hard reason. One. The reason for this question. This is like, what would you rather have spent your money on? Class war. Class war. <laughs> Actual class war. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I should have. Sp- 
I should have put it towards. Um, I was gonna say something that would get me on a list. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. I should have put it t- towards the Ted Kaczynski Freedom Fund. <laughs> <laughs> the Unabomber. Uh, Unabomber school. <laughs> we got. We got to get all of the serial killers out of prison. I really want the Parasite remake with the Trump family, with with Baron like fainting. I wonder if if he was inspired by that extremely fake news story where it was like when uh, Kathy Griffith got in trouble for that photo where she had beheaded Trump, and then like yeah. they were like Ivanka Trump was like my my our son Baron saw it on TV and he thought it was real and that his father had died. Shame on you! He was so scared and sad, <laughs> and like everyone was like. No, he didn't. <laughs> yeah. But- Such an obvious lie. And people are like, liberals are, are making fun of the sun for being upset. And they're like, no, because we all know it's fake. Like, we know <laughs> it didn't happen. Yeah. Fuck, fuck the Trumps. Who cares? Traumatize the shit out of that kid. That kid, that kid's going to die in the uh, class war anyway. Who cares? Fuck everything. <laughs> I wish I would have spent my money on um, a gas mask so that, the tear- <laughs> so that the tear gas doesn't get in my eyes. Uh and when the SWAT team kicks down the doors. <laughs> yeah. I man, I we we need to start like we need to start collecting all those like Hong Kong uh, protest hacks. Like uh, yeah, there needs yeah. to be YouTube like compilations of like here's like top 5 fun protest hacks. Like number 1. I'm expecting like like the 5 minute magic like weird sped up like public domain music, but it's like here's how to like obscure facial like recognition <laughs> software. Yeah, here's how to use a traffic cone to put out a tear gas canister. <laughs> So, um, get tear gas in your eyes and it's like a woman sped up going like, whoa, whoa, whoa. don't like, don't use water, <laughs> use milk. And it's like her smiling while like pouring milk to the side of her face because it's fake. Yeah. But like, there's like tears and blood coming out of her face. <laughs> <laughs> what would you not rather have spent your money on? Um, another ticket to the Joker. <laughs> Big Actually, thing. wait, I want to take my answer back. Instead of that, I'd have rather spent the money to like have someone be like listen i will cover your movie ticket but you can't see joker you have to see parasite (laughs) yeah that would have been really nice i I would i would have i would have spent my ticket money on someone else seeing parasite yeah no i I, because i'd go see it again anyway i'm gonna if anybody says the word joker around me for like the rest of the year i'm just gonna be like shut the fuck up watch parasite yeah uh you'll like it better um and yeah that's my recommendation parasite is is it a masterpiece Eh, masterpiece of shit (laughs) masterpiece of fucking buffalo ass uh yeah i i parasite makes me parasick (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) um but as far as my as far as that actually was literally armin white's review basically (laughs) oh god he hated it he hated it he hated it you know who else hated it because he hated it because and i'm not saying this because he doesn't like movies but because he's literally politically like reactionary that's why he hated it oh that's fun we love that he's a conservative it's it's one of those things where it's like I sometimes enjoy reading Armin White's reviews because he's um he's a contrarian, but he has a very specific approach that I think can lead to some interesting reviews. Mm-hmm. But anytime he disagrees with a movie politically, his review fucking sucks because he doesn't fucking watch the movie. Yeah. His review of Get Out is fucking terrible. He gets like basic facts of the film wrong. <laughs> on, on on this podcast, we well, I at least have a complicated relationship to Armin White's reviews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i, no, I think i, mean, I think they can be interesting i think again like i said if it's a film he disagrees with politically his reviews are always fucking atrocious yeah yeah we we don't we don't stand but we do we we, we don't stand but we do defend yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely and that's, that's somebody has to be the one out there giving critically acclaimed movies one bad review <laughs> and it will be and it will always be armin white it will always be armin white someone you know someone has to thank you thank you armin white uh, and thank you viewers for sitting sitting through this uh hopefully to this point uh there's yeah obviously a lot to cover in a movie that kind of hints toward the entirety of human history yeah um in its in, there's in its a specter <laughs> haunting park <laughs> yeah, there, there is a ghost haunting <laughs> all of us the, ghost the world of... is a vampire <laughs> yeah. oh i get it like parasite oh yeah <laughs> Um, <laughs> who say who do you think was the parasite? Uh, who was the parasite? Society. Society is the who. parasite. Uh, and if you get a chance, check out his other movies. Uh, Mother is probably my favorite. Uh, I've been wanting to rewatch Mother because I was t- uh, describing it to my roommate 
uh, and I remembered how fucking good that movie was. It's so good. I think I think I literally saw Parasite because I didn't really know his work as much at the time. Like I'd seen the host, but I was I, I haven't seen his other stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But it was like right after Old Boy came out, so there was like that South Korean like director craze. Yeah, that's sort of where, people, where people were like, South Korean movies are so crazy, and so I went and saw it, and I was like, oh, this is really good. Uh, I also saw I saw The Devil, which was fucking garbage. Yeah, we won't. We, let's not go into that. But that movie suck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, folks. Um, yeah, but thanks so thanks so much for joining us. Yeah. Um, and we hope to see you again back here soon for our other stuff. Yeah, Lighthouse dropping. Lighthouse, the host, and uh, Film Critters uh, and full episode four, which is in process. Yeah, progress. almost like more than halfway. Um, <laughs> it's complicated. You'll hey, see. You'll see. Listen, pay, listen. Full time job. Got to pay rent. Premiere, Pre- Adobe Premiere. Uh, we're, we're currently. My computer is fucking dying. We're cr- yeah, we're currently looking at possible ways to help uh, get more money so that Brew can yeah. replace her computer because it's part of, of. I saw the I saw the Premiere files and it is literally sp- was split into four different chunks. I, I, I had to split it into four sequences and the file name is currently copy of copy of copy of. <laughs> uh, because my computer keeps uh, spontaneously shutting down on a moment's notice when I'm trying to work in Premiere. Um, so we'll figure that out. Yeah. Uh, uh, good for my stomach to grumble like, while yeah. I'm saying that. Can you... Get, hey, I have some loaded opinions about Parasite. Wonder why. Uh, <laughs> join our Patreon. Join our Patreon. Please, please join our please. Patreon. I'm fucking begging you. Um, and thanks so much for watching. Yeah. Yeah. And I, Universal Healthcare Now. Universal Healthcare Now, Bernie 2020. I'm Baru. <laughs> I'm Jay Bearhat. Uh, bye. Bye. <laughs>